give yourself an expiration date, usually shorter than the one that's like an long term goal. So let's say seven days, because most people can do something for seven days. And seven days is a good sort of like a taste test. I'm going to try this for seven days and see, reevaluate. Do I like it? Is it working for me? And the, here's the language that I prefer. Is it serving me? Hello, fellow creative voyagers. This week on the Indie Author Podcast, I talk with Roland Denzel about aiming lower. The secret to hitting big goals is targets so easy you can't miss them, including how big goals teach bad habits, how tiny dopamine hits mean the world to your habits, how habits need slack and an expiration date, and his advice, one at a time, please. And now let's hear from Roland Denzel about aiming lower. The secret to hitting big goals is targets so easy you can't miss them. Hello, and welcome to the Indie Author Podcast. Today, my guest is Roland Denzel. Hey, Roland, how are you doing? Hey, good morning, Maddie. I'm doing great. That's great to hear. And to give our listeners and viewers a little bit of background on you, Roland Denzel created The Indestructible Author in 2015 to help authors just like him be more productive and write more books, all while staying healthy, happy, and sane. You might know Roland as the author of numerous health, fitness, and nutrition books, a health coach, and a restorative exercise specialist. But the truth is, Roland has always been an author first. He has written over 10 books, dozens of short stories, hundreds of blog posts and articles, and at least one poem, all while raising a family and working a 60-hour-a-week day job. And Roland previously joined me in episode 155, which was the benefits and costs of membership. And so this was a while ago. I can't remember the context where this came up, but I heard Roland talking about something and invited him on the podcast to recap it. And this is great because normally now I'm playing with ChatGPT to come up with an intriguing title, and you did this for me. So the title of what we're going to be talking out about is Aim Lower, The Secret to Hitting Big Goals is Targets So Easy You Can't Miss Them. And then Roland even gave me like a little teaser for what we're going to be talking about. Whether it's writing a book in a month or setting the same resolutions year after year, the big goals we set for ourselves often come with unsustainable habits. But what if the secret to reaching your big goals is to big build habits so small you simply can't fail. So I just love this. And Roland was also kind enough to send me some bullet points for what he wanted to cover with this topic. He did all the work for me because it's so great. Hmm. And so the first one that we want to talk about is big goals teach bad habits. Talk a little bit about that. Well, I mean, I believe probably as an author, we probably all tried to do like NaNoWriMo, for instance, National Novel Writing Month. And you get all mentally prepared for it. And you say, I'm going to get up in the morning or work at lunch or, or all of the above. And I'm going to do write 1,666 words per day. And like it's 30 days. So you just knuckle through and you get you just get it done. But what happens is it's, I mean, it's such a challenge. I, I mean, and there, there are good things to do. There are good things about challenges like this. It can prove to you that you can do it. But the downside is that it doesn't really teach you any good habits. In fact, it probably taught you some bad habits because if you have to knuckle through something, that's not sustainable. Like if you have to force yourself to do all these things and then you're dreading it or you're regretting it, then at the end of that month, it's very unlikely you're going to continue the same way. You're going to tone it down or you're going to change your process. And like so many people like crash at the end of National Novel Writing Month and to like take the next month or two or three off and they don't look at that book again or any book for a long period of time. So what did that teach you? It taught you that you can do something hard, that you can physically do something hard, but also that like taught you that writing is hard and it's miserable on a subconscious level because, you know, we have to give our, our subconscious minds a lot of credit for, for doing things to, 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 to help us and also to hurt us. It's the, our subconscious is there to protect us. And it's not always, we don't always want that protection. Yeah, I have never done uh, NaNoWriMo, nor have I ever used word count as a measure of my writing, because my fear would be that if I had to write 1,666 words a day or whatever, that I would get to 1,500, and then I would just write 166 words of crap, because I would feel like I had to, it would be like an assembly line, like when mm -hmm. the assembly line starts moving too fast, then you just, you're slapping the piece of thought or whatever, because the, the goal becomes more uh, important than the quality. Yeah. Well, in that case, like, is that a bad habit? Yeah. It's like, do you just want to write words for words? Right. Like, what is, what is the point of that? Right. So you're just going to have to delete those words the next time. Or when you get through editing, you're going to be like, what was I, what did I mean here? This is like nonsense. 
So that's definitely a big part of it. There's also the thing where let's say there's a, you take a day off and there's like all these fancy spreadsheets that people can use for Nan National Novel Writing Month. So you get to a certain point and like it's Thanksgiving. So you're like, well, I'm not going to be, I'm traveling that day and family and traveling back. So no writing that day, which is, should be fine. Right? So the spreadsheet auto adjusts to where now like the next day it's going to be, well, in order to make my thing, I either need to write, you know, 35, whatever the next day, or the spreadsheet will auto adjust where it's 1,754 words per day. And you're like, eh. so you can just feel like everything like tighten up and it's like, oh my gosh. And then if you, if you're sick or some sort of an emergency, your laptop crashes or whatever, and then it takes you a while to get it back. Then the next day it's like 1900 words. Well, now pretty soon, like, so all of this, because you have a goal of meeting this arbitrary thing of 50,000 words in a month right? So again, you get to the end of the month, hopefully you will have finished it. Because then you will have like, Oh, you've checked this dopamine box, I know I can do something hard when it comes to writing. But if you fail, like you get the opposite of a dopamine rush, the opposite of a dopamine hit, like you have told your, your conscious mind and your subconscious that you you failed at this before. So next November, or the next time you decide I'm going to really write or do this much hard writing in a month, you're like, well, even if you consciously think you can do it, subconsciously, there's part of you that's going, well, last time it didn't work out so well, did it? When last time it was really hard, wasn't it? And last time you just felt your body tense up so many times that like, is it really worth it? And then you either decide it is worth it and you make it even harder on yourself. I'm going to be more strict with myself this time. So I know I'm going to succeed, which if you fail, then it's even worse, right? And now you're really piling on yourself. Or if you do, okay, well, the, the, the solution that you've now taught yourself is that you just got to write harder. You just got to work harder, right? And that's not true. Well, the reality is you need to write, you need to find a way that you can write that is sustainable, enjoyable, and continually gives you little little successful rewards. I've done it. I've done it. I've done it. So you want those kinds of things. You want little positive outputs or outcomes in order to to build these habits and to to tell yourself that you're on the right track. Yeah, if I were in charge of the world, the two changes I would make to NaNoWriMo is not to do it in November because the only worst month they could have picked would be December. Like, can't why, why don't you do it in January when nothing else is going on anyway? And the other thing is, I think it would be cool to have if you if you really want to get 50,000 words and it comes out to 1,666 or whatever you said, then write 30, 1,500 word short stories. Because then at least at the end of the month, you could say, well, I didn't get 30, 1,500 word short stories, but I got 21, 51 word short stories. So that like you you have an actual finished thing. Like even if you if your schedule totally goes out the window, you might have like three 1500 word short stories. And at least you can say, look, I finished these three things, not I didn't finish this one ginormous thing. Yeah. Well, see, that's good for you because I know you write short stories. Mm -hmm. But with people who, so the downside to somebody who's new to short stories is it could take hours of mental thought and energy to come up with the idea for a short story, right? So now if you have to do that every day, you're going to be, you might even be like some people will do better. Some people will be even more exhausted by the end of that 30 days. And some people will like, oh, I, I could never write a short story that could just ruin them. So like, like if we get into the the next bullet I gave you, mm -hmm. goals, goals should be so small, you can't fail, yep. you know, fail proof, right? So think of a goal that you could do that you want to do, like your goal is to write short stories, your goal should not be to write 30 short stories, right? That's like a long term goal. And it's very arbitrary. Just like 50,000 words, you, your goal to be write a novel, right? Yeah, that's great. So you put that off in the distance, then you say, well, what are the things that I need to do? What are the habits or what are the systems I need to put in place in order to write a novel or to write these short stories, then you like drill them down to the very smallest elements. And those are the things that you can set your daily little goals or your daily little systems in place, but they but you need to make them easy. Let's take sh short story. Let's take let's take National Novel Writing Month. We'll use that. Pretend it doesn't exist. But somebody says, I want to write a novel, which is the same goal as National 
or NaNoWriMo. So I'm going to write a novel. So you could say, well, I need to write more. I need to write regularly. I need to keep my story moving. So what can I do that is that I think is sustainable, that I can absolutely accomplish every day or most days, and that I will feel good about it once I'm doing it? So like for me, like I would say, I can imagine myself back before I did NaNoWriMo. If I was putting myself in that position, I said, you know what? I do, in general, I have about an hour a day where I can spend some time writing. It's broken up over the, throughout the day. So I would say, oh, you know what? I am going to, I think I can write an hour a day. Then you think about, okay, well, is it every day? Like how, on a scale of one to 10, how likely am I to be able to accomplish that? I don't know, it's a six. Well, if it's a six, that's, it's not 60% chance. Uh, that's not very good. That's too hard. It needs to be small. I mean, the goal needs to be smaller. Like think of a smaller goal, even smaller, the smallest goal you can come up with that you know you can achieve. So say, well, okay, like, can I do an hour total throughout the day? Okay, that's better. Instead of an hour in the morning, I can do spread my hour throughout the day. Okay, maybe that's like 70, 80%, seven or eight on the one to 10. And I'm going to say, well, does it have to be every day? Well, no, but it has to be maybe five days a week. Six days a week is too hard. So it's only like a seven. So five days a week, I could probably do that, especially if, the, if I don't spe specify which five days. So five days a week, an hour a day of writing, and I'm going to qualify writing as sitting in front of my computer and doing nothing else but putting words on my digital page. Um, I think that's a nine. I think that's pretty achievable, a nine or a 10, because I can find a way to get that, you know, five days a week. That's the kind of goal you need to have, right? And for short stories, if you're really good about short stories, you might think, okay, so I want to work on a short story every day. It doesn't have to be the same short story, because especially at the beginning, if you haven't written a short story, it could take a lot of not just time thinking, but if whenever you're learning something new, it not only takes mental energy, but what I call like emotional energy, because if something frustrates you, it's like you can feel the emotions come up. You're not just like, oh, it's frustrating. And like my CPU is spinning. It's like frustrating. And I'm feeling it viscerally in my body. Like this is so frustrating. And then like these subconscious things, I can do it. I can't do it. Like all these things are coming up. It's like emotional energy. And that can be for authors, especially that can be so draining to where like they burn themselves out very quickly. So you might want to think about, I'm going to, you might, you might put the same type of rules that I just did for myself for a novel. It might say, well, I'm going to work on my short story for an hour a day. And then I'm going to list off or make a, the tiny little things that make up creating a short story, coming up with an idea or a character or a setting, sitting in front of my computer and typing, outlining, it doesn't really matter what it is, as long as you, in your agreement with yourself, know that those are the little things that were required to meet your goal. Yep. Yeah. And then the next bullet, which was tiny dopamine hits me to mean the world to your habits. It's the, the reaction of you acting on those 90%, 100% smaller goals, correct? That, that you're getting the dopamine hit because you're succeeding at that small goal, not the opposite of the dopamine hit because you failed at the bigger goal. Exactly. Exactly. So you probably know who Jerry Seinfeld, probably everyone here knows who Jerry Seinfeld is, the comedian. And so he had a challenge for himself and to write a joke a day. Didn't have to be a good joke. Didn't have to be a long joke. Didn't have to be in a, a great joke. Just had to be a joke. He had to spend his time writing a joke per day. And sometimes it's five minutes. Sometimes it's an hour, right? And then, but when he got it done, he would just put an X on his calendar. Well, it doesn't sound like very much, but an X on your calendar creates a dopamine hit. Just like if you have a, a to-do list and you get you check it off, that feels good to check things off. You should always put things on your to-do list that you know you can do because you, <laughs> you get you started, right? And then as your list goes up, like you feel those dopamine hits every day. Those are positive a reinforcement that you're doing the right things with your habits. And the reverse is true. If you can't meet those things, that if you can't make that little hit, you don't get that dopamine hit, well, then you have a slump on that day. So that's why it's important to find something that you know you can do. You feel very confident that you can achieve. 
And there's a little bit more to that. There's more protective measures we can put in place that will mitigate the effects of missing missing that one day. Like I like I talked before, the maybe five days out of seven, not not necessarily every day per week. That's one way that, that that's common. But the these tiny little dopamine hits, and it, so it can be like a check on the calendar. It can be like when little kids like to use like happy face stickers on the calendar, right? You could make your own to do list. You could make your own chart, like Austin Cleon. I don't know if you know who Austin Cleon is. It's like steal like an artist, show your work. He writes those books, right? And he has a thing on his website. It's a little form you can print off. And it's like, depending on the month, it's like a 28, 29, 30 or 31 days, right? It's just like a fun calendar in, in his special handwriting. And he goes, do, do whatever you want. Type at the top, write at the top and put like a sticker, draw, draw something. Just gives you something that gives you that little feeling, that little hit that feels good every day. And they're super tiny, but don't underestimate how powerful something small can be. In your experience, is there a difference between making those kinds of checkoffs physically on a physical document versus in an online task management thing or a spreadsheet or something like that? Um, there probably is. I would say that for a while I used a to-do thing and I, all of my to-do, all of my apps on my phone have the sounds turned off. So when I click a to-do, nothing happens. Like it doesn't vibrate, it doesn't do anything, right? So there's something to be said for that ding, for that noise, right? So you have to find what works for you. Does it feel satisfying? Like does your to-do list wouldn't you make a flash or does it make a ding or does it vibrate in your hand? Does it send you a message or a notification? That, that feels good because that's another thing like uh, i think it's microsoft to do every time you check it off it'll send you an email or something at the end of the day saying you've done something so that could be enough to get that email um so i recommend like unless you're sure that the digital works for you and makes you feel good when you click it find something here in the real world tangible like the example that i give is those little silver bells that hotels and restaurants used to have, right? Ding, 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 right? Get one of those and keep it on your desk or next to your, I don't know, wherever your goal is. Like, we're to keep it next to your door. So, like, when you see it and you get there, like, oh, I did that today. Ding, and hit it. <laughs> but it's something. So, that's why, I mean, but other things like that, stickers are so inexpensive, right? Stickers are inexpensive. You could have a calendar, like, I have a big whiteboard calendar over here and just checking it off with a different color pen is really nice. I realized that the the task management software uses Trello. And in Trello, if you can put a checklist attached to an item, and so I have one like my daily tasks, the things that I do every day, check scribe count and check my promotion calendar and things like that. And I've uh, added an automation so that on my daily calendar, once I've checked everything off, first of all, if you check everything off, the, when you check off the last thing, all the little check boxes like vibrate in a happy vibrate. way. And then, oh, that's good. And then it it uh, clears out all the check marks and it moves the task to the next day. So it is sort of uh, like what you're saying about the stickers. It is oddly satisfying to have a little happy dance Isn't from, it? The, yeah. from the check boxes. Yeah, yeah. Other things you can do is, is if you have, this doesn't really work if you're not very active on social media, because you can post things on social media that like, hey, I did it for the day. Like it might be super annoying if like you're to your Facebook friends, if you post every day that you did it. But if you have like maybe one thing, here's my goal for the week. And every day you, you make, you add that comment to it, right? That you've done it that day. That could be different. And, but you have to, if that is satisfying for you. And if you have enough friends or in your group or you have followers or whatever, who are following along, you're going to get response. Good job. You're going to get people saying things like that. So that could be another way to do it. I want to move on to the next bullet, which is habits need slack. Yeah. So I've learned that not everyone knows what the term slack means, right? So you have to have slack. And slack is just like relaxing. Like it's like you give yourself, you cut yourself some slack. And so that's why I think it's funny. But but habits need the slack too. So slack, I already talked about one type of slack, but I didn't mention the word at the time. But it's like, instead of five, instead of seven days per week, I'm going to do something. I'm going to say, well, five days a week, right? So that's one way of slack, building slack into your, into your, the habit that you're trying to form. Because it's unsustainable, unsustainable 
to do seven days a week of something forever. Something can happen, right? So you either have to make the thing easier or you have to cut yourself some slack and say, hey, I'm not going to be super strict with myself. The key here and the key with all of these things is you have to give yourself slack. You have to make the goals small. You have to define the dopamine hits before you dive in to building the new habit. Like you have to tell yourself what all these rules are before you start doing it. Because if you do them retroactively, even though you have a good reason to do it, I guarantee deep down somewhere, way down in your soul, in your, in your muscles and in your bones, you will feel the tiniest bit of a failure. Like I'm, oh, you know, I've gone 12 days and I realize that I can't do this seven days a week. So I'm going to do five days a week. Well, that's good. I mean, it's good that you can do that. And I'm not going to tell you not to do that, but the value of having done it ahead of time would have been so much more positive because now you're not changing the rules. When you change the rules, you subconsciously feel a little bit like a failure. And that's the kind of thing you want to hit. You want to, con you want to keep the road going forward with positives and not have to take a step back with negatives. So cutting yourself some slack, it could be anything. It could be, I'm going to do this. Oh, I'm going to do this 80% of the time. I'm going to do it five days a week or seven days a week. I'm going to give myself a day off when, once a month when I need it right? It could be a vac like a vacation day or a personal choice day or whatever you want to call it. There's all these different ways you can build yourself in some slack. You can, the slack can also be, we used an example for NaNoWriMo. Instead of 1,666 words per day, you could say, well, I'm going to do it for an hour. That's a, a type of slack because 1,666 words, the only way to, like you just said, like you have to write fake words. So you have to like, I don't know what to write. So I'm writing these words here that I'm going to delete later, right? <laughs> right? So that's, that does, that works against you because you can't delete those words until you replace them because they all count against your 50,000 words per month. But if it's an hour per day, you can, even if you don't know what to write, Neil Gaiman says, you know what? I don't count my words, but what I do is I have writing time and I sit in front of my computer and the only thing I can do, I don't have to write, but I can't do anything else. Yeah. I don't, don't have to write. That feels more comfortable to me based right. on my writing style. Yeah. So there, that's a different kind of slack. So slack can be anything, but you have to just be, it kind of goes with like giving yourself permission to be not perfect. Mm -hmm. But the key is making sure that you give yourself that permission ahead of time. Well, I like the idea of setting the goals ahead of time not only because you set yourself up for being able to feel good about it when you achieve it, but also because I think that sometimes in thinking through the goals, it's also a way of triaging what you think you want to do. And so you might be thinking of doing NaNoWriMo and as you start thinking through like how you're going to divvy up your time and how you're going to allocate your attention and so on, you may get to the end of that and think, I've thought of every possible alternative. I'm only coming up with 20% likelihood do I really want to do NaNoWriMo? And, and doing it ahead of time kind of gives you a chance to think through that. But I did have yeah. a question about Slack, which is sure. that there's that Slack of, I, I wanted to write for an hour a day, but I'm just not feeling it. Or I was going to write for an hour today, but, you know, my my car broke down and I'm dealing with it or something like that. Like mm -hmm. they're the, the things where you're, you need to acknowledge that you're never going to write seven days a week, five days a week is, is much more realistic. And then those times when you get sick and you just can't mm -hmm. write at all for a week. Do you approach uh, accommodating those kind of emergency situations in a different way? Yeah, that's a great point because there are different things that can come up that will and totally unhook your, your thing, right? And the good news is there is that if it's, I mean, I, I don't want to say catastrophic, but the good news is if it's something that's so bad that like it ruins everything, like let's say your, your car breaks down or you get sick, like I had COVID you know, a couple of weeks ago and I was unable to write for a few days in a row, right? So the good news, I mean, the good news about these things is you do know that you had a good excuse to miss on those days. But it does also help to tell yourself that if something catastrophic comes up, it's un you understand and it's not it's not going to be a point of failure. Yeah. Because there's some things you just can't do. There's sometimes you just can't do. Like if your if your if your electricity goes out and you're writing in 
Google Docs or something that require and your internet goes out, like, like what are you going to do? Like, yeah, you want to catch up, right? You want to fix that problem so it doesn't happen again. You want to click the little box in your Google Docs so you can write on offline, right? But there are things you can do, like things happen. And as long as you acknowledge ahead of time that things happen, and when they do, I'm going to roll with the punches, and it mitigates that, that, that trauma response that you get later. Because what you really want to do is like you're building these little habits. And as you want to successfully do the, get through a habit, build this foundation, then you're going to want to layer another habit, the new and another habit and another habit. Because like we don't write a novel by with one habit. We write a novel with hundreds or thousands of little things that we build into our lives. Everything from writing per day to giving ourselves time to think on a walk to giving ourselves, if we want more time to write, we might plan our meals ahead of time or do batch cooking or like there's all these different things that we can do that aren't writing and re related at all that can make our chances of writing our novel more successful yeah and yeah so so giving yourself all those little dopamine hits along the way will make it much more likely for you to add another little ha try another little habit of a similar level and build and build and build I think another way to deal with those catastrophic uh, moments would be baking in the goal so small you can't fail because, and the habits need slack. Because let's say you start feeling really bad on a Monday and you think, okay, I just know, like, this is the catastrophic sort of moment uh, in terms of my goals for my writing. I know that I'm going to feel terrible today. I'm just going to try to get back to it tomorrow. And then the next day you feel bad. So you think, well, okay, today is another catastrophic day. I'm going to get back to it tomorrow. Whereas I think if, if that day you start feeling bad and you know you're getting a cold and you know your colds always last a week, just say, you know what? I'm just gonna, I'm gonna give myself a sabbatical for a week because I know that's how long it takes. Oh, and guess what? I got back to it on day five instead. And now I feel good about myself that I'm getting back to the habit, but uh, not, not making, like not planning after the catastrophic moment in a way that's too aggressive and will just further your sense of failure. Yeah. Well, this is one of the, the barriers like you, that's a great point, but it also reminds me of one of the issues where we as a people have a tendency to, we start things at New, on New Year's Day, first of the month, Monday, our birthdays, like arbitrary, they're like, they're like real days in the calendar and I understand why you do them, but they're in the grand scheme of things, they're pretty arbitrary. And even saying, I'm going to do this for the month of November is also arbitrary, right? Mm -hmm. So you could say, well, I'm going to do it for 30 days. And in your example, you could say, I need that sabbatical. I'm going to pick up where I left off after I'm well, right? So yeah, do you have, do you feel like you have to sort of start over a little bit again? Like you can either start over again, or you can pick up where you left off, depending on what works better for your, like if you are already sort of in the groove, give yourself some slack and say, hey, I know it's going to take a couple of days to ramp back up to where I was. But I just want to, it's going to feel good for me to pick up where I left off and say, hey, I did 30 days of this. Yeah, there was a sickness there. I had, a, I had some sick days in between. Um, but when you link it to November or December or January, right, you can't get that back. Yeah. You can't say, well, I'm going to finish NaNoWriMo in December because that's not NaNoWriMo anymore. Yeah. NaNoWriMo is an official thing and it's in November. So even though you mean that well, like you, part of you is going to say, well, it's not quite, it's not quite NaNoWriMo. Yeah. yeah. Well, every time NaNoWriMo comes up, I explain why I don't do it. I feel like to give right. equal time, I'm going to have to get a NaNoWriMo person on the podcast to represent the other view, but maybe not in October because I'm sure they're all booked up with podcast interviews in October. But I do, I mean, it obviously works well for some people, but just considering whether it works well for you or not. Um, so the next bullet we have here is habits need to have an expiration date. Yeah, this one's a big one. This is all sort of part of Slack, if you think about it that way. But when you're, when you're trying to build a new habit, if you say, I'm going to do this forever, and, and you don't like it, well, then eventually you're going to feel bad about it because you're abandoning it. So if I'm trying to write 1,666 words per day, and I don't like it the, at the end of the month, First of all, like me, whether I did it or didn't, if I hated it, I haven't learned nothing. All I've learned is that I don't like it, but I haven't learned a positive habit that's going to help me along, right? So if you give yourself an expiration date, usually shorter than the one that's like an long-term goal, 
right? So let's say seven days, because most people can do something for seven days. And seven days is a good, sort of like a taste test. I'm going to try this for seven days and see, reevaluate. Do I like it? Is it working for me? And, and the, here's the language that I prefer. Is it serving me? Like if I continue on with this habit, right? Is it serving me well, right? Because if it's not, if I don't like it, if I have to cringe and force myself to do it, then, then I'm not going to be able to, even though I'm filing through, I'm not going down, you know, I'm not going to be able to continue it forever. So I'm wasting my time continuing it. So giving it that seven days, for instance, expiration date and saying, hey, at the end of seven days, if I reevaluate and I don't like it, I can either make it easier, change, change the rules, or abandon it entirely for, not so abandon it, but like stop doing it and replace it with something, start over again with something I, I don't want to do, I do want to do. Because who here hasn't tried something? Because there's this myth of the 21 days to build a habit, right? Which is totally fabricated, right? There's like, it's not, there's no science in that at all. But you can still, but you should know within a few days whether you like something or not or whether you hate something or not. And giving yourself that expiration date means that you do not have to abandon it. A realistic yeah, expiration date, it's hard to say. So yeah, for seven days, 10 days, whatever, if you realize, oh, it's, it's, so it's part of that slack. And it also saves you from wasting time. Yeah, I like that idea of asking if it's serving you because I think that there's also the probably less common but still a uh, possible problem where you've uh, successfully incorporated a habit into your life. It was serving you well for a while, and now you're doing it without really thinking about it. And if you have both an expiration date and a check-in date to say, mm -hmm. okay, I've been doing this for, for a, a month, a year, two years, a decade, or whatever, and is it still a valuable way for me to spend my time? Is it giving me the benefits I was looking for and so on? Yeah, exactly. Um, and the sixth bullet you suggested was one at a time, please. Yeah. So we have a tendency to like dive right in. I'm going to write my novel. So I'm going to write 1666 words. Or I'm going to write an hour. I'm going to get up early. I'm going to not watch Netflix. Like you put all of these things on at one time, which all sound really good, right? This is what it would take for me to finish my novel. I'm going to do all of these things. Well, that's a lot of things to try at once. And it's a lot, we go back to that mental and emotional energy, giving yourself the space to try something new. So when you're trying five or six new things at a time, or three, even three new things at a time, each one becomes more difficult to, to, to experience and to try and to test and to see whether, whether you like it. If I try all those things at, that I just mentioned at once and after a week, like, do I just hate my life? <laughs> now my new life that I've built for myself. This is the right of a the life of an author. No more Netflix, getting up early in the morning and sitting down and writing an hour every day. Oh, I don't want to do that. Right. But if you try one at a time and then each one is more likely to succeed and you're and each one is, can be fine tuned to be a habit that you will not only be able to keep up, but you, that in theory you should enjoy. Yeah. Right. So you've heard of habit stacking, right? Mm -hmm. I prefer the term habit layering because when you're layer, uh, habit stacking means like I have a habit, I'm just going to put all these things, like I just mentioned, Netflix, getting up early, whatever, but habit layering means like, Hey, I've, I've sort of semi mastered a habit. I feel like I have it on cruise control now. Like I, I'm writing an hour a week and it's only been seven to 10 days. I have the mental space, the emotional space to try to add a new one on top of it, to layer it, right? Something that doesn't conflict. Like, it's not like I'm going to write an hour and a half. It's to, I'm going to keep that one because I'm going to build that habit. Habits take 21, 30, 90 days to build. So I'm going to keep going with that one. And then I'm going to say, you know what? I feel like I, I could write better if I got up a little bit earlier. So now I can just try that. And then do, you have to go back to the top, right? You have to make that getting up earlier so small that you can't fail. Like how much earlier can you give up, get up, right? And you have to like think about it, all those things. Like am I going to be disturbing my family? Do I need to grind my coffee beans? Like there's all these things that can go, that can be, be part of it. But then you master or sort of 
get on a really good track with that second habit, then you can tr- think about layering the next one and then the next one and the next one. We just don't have the strength, the emotional strength to compartmentalize multiple habits at once, especially when they are all coming together towards one goal. Yeah. And then when we fail, like we feel now we failed like a whole bunch of things. This sort of, I'm a nutritionist and a health coach, right? So this is what happens when people say on Monday, I'm going to start the whatever, the, the big diet, the keto diet, and I'm going to go to the gym five days a week. And I need to go start going to bed earlier because I know that's going to help me go to the gym. Like they do all of these things. And then after like two or three weeks, they're like, well, I look back and they're like, oh, I stopped doing all these things. What a failure. So they give up everything. And because it was all tied together, it was one thing that they were doing. They give up everything. And then how long does it take you to, to start again? Because every time you have a failure, it's that much harder to start again, no matter what it is. If you've, if you've ever been on a diet, you think, oh, you know what? I was on a diet last year. It didn't really work. I'm going to try it again. Right? Well, you could try it right now. You could try it on Monday. You could try it. But you just keep putting it off because consciously and subconsciously, last time you tried, you failed. And this way, this time, it's probably going to be the same. So the way to mitigate that is to go through these steps. Smaller dopamine hits, cutting yourself some slack, giving an expiration date and one at a time, and then layer them as every time you succeed. Well, it's interesting because as we've chatted about this before, I I have a challenge with getting enough movement in my life, and I've talked to many guests about this. And a couple of months ago, I was at a book club, and I, this came up. Someone asked me like, what, what my day was like as a, an author, a full-time author and publisher and podcaster, and I kind of described it. And I made this comment about like, how it was a very sedentary lifestyle. And afterwards, one of the women in the book club came up to me and said, introduce yourself. And she said, I'm the executive director of the local YMCA. And I don't know if you've ever been to the YMCA, but here's my card. If you'd like a tour, give me a call and I'd be happy to take you through it. And I thought, sure, why not? I hadn't been to the YMCA, even though it's six minutes from my house, because I had this probably like a decades out of date idea. Like I must have been in a YMCA at one time in my childhood. And that's what I thought all YMCAs were, were like. But I thought, oh, I'll, I'll go do a tour. It was a very nice place. They had a lot of things that that appealed to me. And so I signed up and I started going. And one of the things that I really liked about it, and this I'm telling the story because it's illustrating, I think, a lot of the points we've talked about. One of the things I really liked about it is that it had an app and you you could sign up for classes the day before. And so I love the fact that I wasn't committing to like 10 weeks of yoga. It was like, I would go, I would do aqua aerobics. And then when I went out to the car after aqua aerobics, I'd open the app and I'd look at the next day and I'd think, oh, chair yoga, that sounds like fun. I'm going to do chair yoga. So I had a lot of flexibility about what I was signing up for. If I decided I didn't like the aqua aerobics, I, I didn't have to go and I wasn't like wasting any money or anything like that. And then, and I was getting into a really good schedule for this. I was I was sticking with it. And I found that, on the days when I went to the YMCA, I was also more likely to take the dogs for an extra walk because I was always already out and about. So like one good thing led to another good thing. Then at the end of December, I got the flu and I obviously didn't go to the YMCA. And then after I was done over the flu, I still had this chronic cough and nobody wants to be around someone who's coughing a Uh lot these days. So I wasn't going to the YMCA then. And then I was on vacation, so I wasn't going to the YMCA. And I got back from vacation about a week ago. And the the earlier part of the story is I used to have an item on my calendar from 10 to 11.30 was when I blocked off for going to the YMCA. But then when I got into the habit of it, I took the calendar entry off because I'm like, this is great. I don't need the calendar entry anymore. But when I got back from vacation, I sort of, that has sort of fallen off my mental radar screen. It wasn't that I was thinking about going to the YMCA and deciding not to. It had just disappeared from my conscious mind of things that I needed to bake into my day. And I realized that I should have I should have put it back on my calendar as a reminder and kept it on there until I didn't need it anymore as a reminder. But I think that that, that's illustrating in my own life, all those things about goals being small, like, yes, tomorrow I'm going to go to the YMCA and the dopamine hit of saying, today I went to the YMCA and all those good things. So this is a good reminder to me to get that back on my calendar and on my actual schedule. 
Okay. I mean, there is some benefit to changing that reminder on your calendar too, because after a while that it just becomes the calendar, I had a reminder every day, like you sort of tune it out. I think the benefit is that it blocked my time. So like oh, yes, I do have good. events that get scheduled automatically through Calendly. And so it was all, it was a reminder to me, but it also kept other things from showing up smart. in that it's block, smart, yeah. which, which was important. Yeah, I like that. So I do have to say, when I was reading over these notes ahead of time, and you were talking about the, the power of small and things like that. And then I look back over your bio, which ends with raising a family and working a 60 hour a week day job. So I guess in closing, I just want to ask personally, as someone who's achieved the things that I describe in your bio, is there any contradiction there that, that, that we need to discuss? Like, did you say I am going to not only raise a family, but I'm going to work a 60 hour a week day job. And then I'm also going to do all the things you're doing on top of that. How does that all mesh together? How does that work logically together? Well, so like my goal is not to be a full-time author. My goal is to be just to write books that people enjoy. Yes, I do want to make some money from my books, but my, that's not my primary goal. I mean, well, making the money from my books is a good, is a good goal, right? And is a strong part of my goals. But I have no illusions about being a full-time author I wrote books that I really want to, most they're, mostly they're health and fitness books. I have some urban fantasy coming up, but right now they're health and fitness. And I really want, I had a message that I wanted to get out there. So it's putting it out there. I knew that I had a family that was important. And sometimes I've had a full-time job and sometimes I've had jobs that you sort of, you know, I was a health coach and an author coach and I did consulting for printing and publishing companies. So like it all adds up to those things, but that was like where I was primarily making my money. So I had to sort of say like, well, wh here's what I'm doing. Like, this is my, this is my life. I have a family. There's, I can't not take care of my family. Right. And I also have these jobs. I have this work. So I looked at like, how can I build a writing career around that foundation? So that's where I come up with where I can write an hour a day. And luckily I, I've trained myself over time to be able to write where I don't have to write like a solid block of time. I can sometimes write in the morning. If I have a, a longer lunch break, I can take half an hour of my lunch and I can write in half an hour there. If I have the energy to write after work, I can write a little bit there. So over time it's come to where like sometimes it's an hour and a half of writing. Sometimes it's half an hour of writing, but it's sort of built around my, my life rather than formed my life, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So cool. Yeah. Well, it's always lovely to speak with you and so helpful to be reminded of these things that make so much sense when you describe them, but are sometimes hard to remember in the moment when you get all caught up in whatever the, yeah. the latest thing is you want to do. I do have a freebie that people can go and download. If they go to indestructibleauthor.com slash habits, they can download the thing. It's got a, like a sort of a, a poster you can print off, stick it on your fridge or on your desk. And it will give you all these habits and goes into a little bit more detail on like how to set your goals, how to set your habits and all of the ways to do, you get your little dopamine hits. And I think signing up for my email list is a dopamine hit in and of itself. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much, Roland. You're very welcome. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Roland. Are you going to make changes to your approach to goal setting based on his advice? In what way have you broken down a big goal into the smaller goals he recommends? I would love to hear your thoughts. Just leave a comment on YouTube and please subscribe while you're there. And if you got value from this episode and were thinking, I wish I could buy Maddie a cup of coffee, you can do that. Scroll to the bottom of any page at theindieauthor.com and click buy me a coffee to make a small contribution via PayPal or Stripe. Until next time, here's wishing you favorable winds and smooth sailing on your creative voyage. <laughs>